So today we are going to be uh, beginning our study of the central force problem in quantum mechanics. Okay, so the goal is to understand uh, how to solve the central force problem in quantum mechanics. So what is a central force? A central force problem in quantum mechanics. A central force in physics is characterized by a potential that depends only on the distance r. What does this mean? This means that, remember that uh, in three dimensions, the potential can depend on, so in, in terms of uh, the spherical polar coordinates, the three coordinates are theta and phi, right? So suppose if you have a potential that depends only on distance. So in general, v is a function of r, theta, and phi, but if a potential does not know anything about the angular coordinates, and suppose if V is a function of V of R alone, then the force derived from such a potential can be written as F is minus, so in general, F is minus del B, but in the case of central force, the force, since there is no dependence on angles, the force is simply minus dV dr, okay? So such a force is called a central force. It, so the force only depends on the distance of the particle from some specific point and not on uh, where the particle is located in the in, in space in terms of uh, theta and phi. So this means that suppose if I draw a circle, um, so let us say, circle, right? And all points on this circle are characterized by various angles of theta. So suppose if this is my origin, this is r, excuse me, this is my r. So this is some theta one, and this is some theta two, and so on and so forth. But the force doesn't care about where you are on this circle, right? The force is only proportional to how far you are um, from the central point O. Okay, such a force is called a central force in uh, physics. And of course, you have studied the central force problem in classical mechanics. Um, Kepler problem is an example of a central force problem. So here we will, in quantum mechanics, we'll also study the central force problem. But uh, it turns out that uh, one has to uh, do a little bit of work in setting up the problem in quantum mechanics because of certain unique features of quantum mechanics. So before I set up this problem, I'm going to take a uh, like the majority of this lecture maybe, or at least half of this lecture, to uh, talk to you about symmetries in quantum mechanics, okay? Symmetries in quantum mechanics. Symmetries are actually very useful in classical mechanics also, but symmetries take a much bigger role in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory for a specific reason. So we will explain what this reason is in one second, uh, but I want to make a few brief remarks on what is symmetry in quantum mechanics and how symmetries are realized in quantum mechanics. Okay. So as you know by now very well, in quantum mechanics, the state of a physical system is described by some vector psi in the Hilbert space, right? So this is the state of a physical system. in the Hilbert space of the problem, which I'm calling H. Now, you also know that there are operators that can act on the state vectors or any vectors in the Hilbert space and change them into some other states, right? So I can have operators A, and these act on the vectors and they, in general, give you a new vector that lies in the same Hilbert space H, okay? So the operator should not take the state out of the Hilbert space. So we demand that the operator acts on any vector to give you a new vector in the same Hilbert space. And unless I'm talking about a unitary unit operator, one, psi and psi prime in general are different vectors, right? So the uh, role of an operator is to act on something and give you something else, all right? So when do we claim that this operator is a symmetry operator? 
symmetry. So let us assume that I have some operator u. Okay. And this acts on every single vector in the Hilbert space to give me a new vector psi prime. Both psi prime and psi belong to the Hilbert space H. Okay. Now I claim that this operation is a symmetry if it does not change the probability amplitudes. In other words, suppose if there was an initial state psi i, okay, and a final state psi f, the probability of transition from the initial state to the final state in quantum mechanics, the probability amplitude is given by the overlap psi f, psi i, right? And the probability is the mod of this quantity squared. So I don't want the probabilities to change. If u is a symmetry, then of course every psi i, so now I'm acting u on this Hilbert space, and for every psi i, I have a psi i prime, and for every psi f, I have a psi f prime. And I can equivalently ask the question, how does this amplitude change? I'm gonna ask how the probability changes, the probability is dependent on this amplitude, so let me as well ask how this amplitude changes. So this probability amplitude for the system to go from a state psi i to the state psi f now becomes psi f prime, psi i prime overlap. But this psi f prime, psi i prime, remember that psi i prime is u times psi i and psi f prime is u psi f which means the bra psi f prime is equal to the bra psi f u dagger. Okay, taking the dagger of the equation before. So this psi f psi i becomes psi f prime psi i prime, which can be written as psi f u dagger, and psi i prime becomes u psi i. Okay. So if I want the probability amplitude to not change, then I want u dagger u to be equal to one. If u dagger u is one, then the quantity on the left-hand side and the quantity on the right-hand side becomes exactly similar, okay? Which tells me that if my operator is unitary, it can generate a symmetry transformation such that none of the probability amplitudes or matrix elements equivalently do not change. This necessarily means U is a unitary operator. Now, if you're a little bit uh, careful, you might notice that, look, we don't really measure probability amplitudes. We only measure probability, uh, the total probability. So, u dagger u could also be minus one. The probability amplitude will change by a sign, but the overall probability will not change. So u dagger u equals minus one is also a valid symmetry operation. Uh, and that is true. And in, in, in this respect, the u could also be an anti-unitary operator, uh, but most symmetry operators in quantum mechanics are unitary operators, and this is what we will concentrate on. So on a side, I invite you to look at what is called Wigner's theorem in quantum mechanics. Okay, this is extremely simple to state, but uh, very tricky to prove. Wigner's theorem basically tells you that if U is a symmetry operator, it can be either can only be either unitary or anti-unitary. Okay. Now, this is not part of the main uh, subject of study, even though Wigner's theorem is extremely crucial in quantum mechanics, uh, but it's still, uh, for those of you who are interested in looking at it, please do, I encourage you. So, U has to be a 
if u is a symmetry operator, then we will concentrate on that case where u is a unitary operator. So we are in general interested in those operators that are unitary operators, okay? This is the first point. All right, so what is the form of this u? How should u look like? Okay, before that, let me actually uh, push forward and uh, talk about another important defining property of these symmetry transformations. The symmetry transformations, so what does this mean? This doesn't mean that when, I, when there is a symmetry, nothing changes. No, the states do change, okay? But the observables do not change. In particular, the energy of the states remains the same. So, for example, I can have a U such that it takes me from one state psi to, let us say, another state psi prime, and I can apply u on this state and get a third state psi double prime, whatever I want. I can keep doing this transformation over and over again, but all these states are necessarily degenerate. The energy of the state psi will be the same as the energy of the state psi prime, will be the same as the energy of the state psi double prime. So a symmetry operator does not give you a new state that is different in energy from the original state, okay? Sir, uh, so Sachin says, sir, did you just prove this above? No, I did not. So this is uh, a very simple way of uh, claiming that u dagger u is one, but Wigner's theorem is actually a lot more tricky. So for example, we have, uh, we have uh, developed the subject of quantum mechanics by claiming that it is the vectors that are of paramount importance, okay? But actually it turns out that Vectors can differ by a phase and none of the matrix elements will change. For example, if I consider a state psi, okay, and if I consider another state e to the i theta times psi, let us say, okay. Now, in general, this is, these are two different states, technically speaking, because uh, the axioms of linear vector space tells you that a scalar multiplying a vector will give you a new vector. So this is a new vector. But notice that quantum mechanics does not distinguish between these two vectors at all, okay? So for example, if I um, look at the overlap psi psi, or if I call this some psi prime, the overlap psi prime psi prime, they are both exactly the same. And all matrix elements would also be the same because all observables depend on multiplying one bra vector with one ket vector. And when you do that, the e to the minus i theta and e to the i theta will cancel each other, okay? So what uh, we should actually do, uh, people who do uh, formal constructions of quantum mechanics, they do, is not considered, the starting point is not vector, but it is what are called rays. What are rays? So think of, uh, for example, a, a soldier, an old world soldier who is doing fighting with bows and arrows, right? So he has a quiver in which he has a whole bunch of arrows, right? So think of this quiver with a whole bunch of arrows as a ray. Okay, so this is a terrible picture, but whatever it is. You guys are too uh, young uh, to remember the Ramayana of the 1990s, but uh, this is what you know the mythological figures fought with, yeah? So you can think of this quiver with a large number of arrows as being vectors which are related to each other by a face, okay? So you have to develop quantum mechanics, not with the notion of state vectors, but with the definition of rays. And then Wigner proceeds to construct the uh, proof in a very formal fashion. Ultimately, this is a very simple way of showing the exact same thing, but the actual construction using rays is a little, a little bit more tricky and uh, non-trivial. Uh, if you're interested, I can give you a reference. There is a uh, book called, uh, I think it is called symmetry and supersymmetry in quantum mechanics or something like that. Uh, I'll, I'll dig it out and, and I'll put this on the classroom website. Uh, this book has a very nice uh, proper derivation of, of, this, of this fact. But yeah, this is a very simple way of looking at the exact same thing uh, without going into too many technical details, okay? Any hello, other sir. questions? Sir, I have a question. Sir, hello? Okay. All right. Hello, sir, can you hear me? Hello. Somebody is asking something. 
if we apply symmetry operator two or three times, does the probability amplitude still not change? No, because they're all connected to the same symmetry transformation. So let, let me actually show this. Let us say that psi goes to psi prime, which is u psi, okay? Now, you know that now psi prime psi prime is equal to psi psi, okay? Now, let me go from psi prime to psi double prime, which is u times psi prime, okay? For the exact same reason, the overlap psi double prime psi double prime would also be equal to psi prime psi prime. And we've already shown that psi prime psi prime is the same as overlap of psi psi, so all of the amplitudes remain the same. So you can keep doing this indefinitely and you get the exact same amplitude. So there's a whole bunch of states that can be related to each other by a symmetry transformation. Hello, sir. Okay. Hello. Hello, sir, Make can sense? you hear me? Okay, so let me raise this. Okay. So now another important point is that energy measurements should not tell, sir, we are speaking, but uh, you are not able to hear us. Can you speak now? Sorry. Hello. My audio is on, so I'm not able to understand why it is. Hello, sir. Can um, you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm able to hear you. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe it was on mute. Forgive me. Uh, Sir, if I have an operator that commutes with parity operator, then mm -hmm. I can say that operator is even, right? Operator is? Even operator? Yes. Sir, then is it, had, is it has something to do with his, with his probability? Because here, if you said that if if mod, no, if bra f, no, psi f k i mm -hmm. equal to, is it, isn't changing with time, right? No. Okay, so I'll answer this question. So. Uh, parity is one specific example of a symmetry operator. So when do we say that something is symmetric? So see, remember that Hamiltonian is a sum of kinetic energy term and the potential energy term, okay? So typically kinetic energy term is usually uh, symmetric under many of the transformations. So the non-trivial aspect is looking at the potential energy term. Now there could be potential energy terms that are uh, symmetric as that are even under parity. And there are potential energy terms that are not even under parity. For example, if you have a k of x, a v of x that is uh, minus k x cubed, that is obviously not a parity symmetric operator, which means that in this case, the Hamiltonian and the parity operator will not commute. I'll explain this in more detail for a general case uh, in, in one minute. But of course, if you have a Hamiltonian that commutes with the parity operator, uh, then this uh, parity operator and the Hamiltonian will have common eigenstates, okay? Because they commute, they should have the same eigenstates, which means all the energy eigenstates will also have a definite parity. But the parity operator is a very special operator. It has only two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one, which means all the states of the ham, uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian can either be parity even or parity odd. That is one specific statement for one particular symmetry operation called the parity operator. Again, all this is true only if you have a Hamiltonian that is symmetric under parity. Okay, if it is not, then all this is not true. The eigenstate, the Hamiltonian will no longer commute to the parity operator and the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian will have nothing to do with the eigenstates of parity. Make sense? So now how do I generalize this? I will generalize this by claiming that if you have a general symmetry transformation, one example is parity. Parity is an example of what is called a discrete transformation. Uh, we are more interested in what are called continuous transformations. I will explain the difference between these two in a second. Suppose if you have a, uh, a symmetry, then all these states should have the same energy. So what does this mean? The mathematical statement of this, just like uh, you learned in parity, is that the Hamiltonian should commute with the symmetry operator. Oh, my, my. Thing is not showing again at the same problem. Okay. My Hamiltonian should commute with the symmetry operator. This ensures that 
the new state that I get, the psi prime that I get by application of u on psi will have the same energy as h. How is that? How are these two statements related? Well, let us uh, demonstrate. So let us say that I act this on, excuse me, I calculate this. Since the commutator is zero, this is obviously equal to zero, right? So what is the left-hand side? The left-hand side is h u psi minus u h psi equal to zero, okay? Now, let psi be an eigenstate. Let psi be an eigenstate of h with energy e. In other words, I'm claiming that I'm choosing those states that are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, okay? So the point is this. Now if I substitute this in the former equation, I get h acting on u psi. I'll take it to the other side. This is u acting on h psi. But h acting on psi is just e times psi. So I can write this as e u acting on psi. Now if you look at this equation, you find that h acting on the state u psi equals e times the same state u psi. Okay, now u times psi is not the same as psi. It is a different state psi prime. This is the state psi prime. But what this equation is telling you is that this state psi prime that you get by the application of the symmetry operator on psi is also an eigenstate of the same Hamiltonian with the exact same energy E. Does this make sense to everybody? This is a very important point. So if this is not clear, please stop and ask me questions. So in general, if you have a symmetry in a quantum mechanical system, uh, then it necessarily means that there is a whole bunch of states. How many states depends on the kind of symmetry transformation you're talking about, but there is in general more than one state that are connected by the symmetry transformation, which means you can go from one state to the other by applying the symmetry operator, such that all these states have the exact same energy. So this is an extremely important point. Symmetry, therefore, in quantum mechanics necessarily implies degeneracy. If you have a symmetry in a quantum mechanical system, it necessarily means that you have a whole bunch of states that are connected by the symmetry transformation that have the exact same energy E. Sir, yes. Sir, I'm not able to get uh, what we are trying to do here, what we are trying to uh, prove. Can you, just, uh, uh, can you just explain what we are doing? Sure. Okay. All right. So let me take a step back. So let me just continue here and explain what it is that we are trying to achieve. Look. Our goal in quantum mechanics is always goal is to solve the Schrodinger equation, the time independent Schrodinger equation, right? So let me write it in the position space. This is minus h bar square over 2m. Now in one dimension, this is just d square x, d square over dx square, but in three dimensions, I can write this as del square psi plus v of r psi equals e psi, where psi is in general a function of r, theta, and phi. Is everyone comfortable with the del square operator? Del square operator is d square dx square plus d square dy square plus d square dz square in Cartesian coordinate systems. Okay? So this is our goal. We want to solve this differential equation. Just one second. So assume that you have solved this differential equation. Okay, now let us say that you have solved this differential equation and you have gotten psi of r, theta, and phi. Okay, now you want to know, for example, what is the value of 
angular momentum of this state? What is the value of linear momentum of this state? What is the value of any other operator, which is a physical operator on this state? Okay, on these states, psi of r theta and phi. So in general, if we have a problem in quantum mechanics, let us say that you saw, so let us take a very simple example. Let us take a finite dimensional example. Let us take a two dimensional example. 2D example, okay? Now, um, you're solving the Schrodinger equation and getting to the Hilbert space. Let us say that your eigenstates are psi one and psi two, okay? Now, suppose if you have, uh, now suppose if you ask the question, what it is that other operators do on this Hilbert space, right? So you know by now that since Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, psi one and psi two form the basis vector. Basis vector, so I can always write every vector as a linear combination of psi one and psi two. So I can as well ask, so what is the uh, value of any other operator a on this state? So what is a acting on psi one? A acting on psi two, whatever a is, any other physical, any physical uh, operator. Okay. Now, if I blindly solve and get the um, get the eigenvectors. In general, A acting on psi one for this uh, simple 2D example would be a linear combination of the two vectors, right? Similarly, A acting on psi two would be a linear combination. I can take any other vector B. Let us say that there's three operators, A, B, and C. B acting on psi one would be some A prime psi one plus B prime psi two. This is how things generally work. C acting on psi one would be some A double prime psi one plus B double prime psi two, okay? So far, so good? Yes or no? Yes. Somebody said no? Sir, you have written how you wrote it. If you applied to psi one, then how did you apply to psi one and psi two? So that is how an operator acts in a linear vector space, right? So an operator generally acts to give you a linear combination of all the vectors in the Hilbert space, right? That is the definition of a linear operator. Okay, na? Yeah, definition of a linear operator. A acting on any vector would give you, in, say, remember, in general, we wrote that A acting on the basis vectors would give you some A, I, J, E, J. Okay? So this is how operators in general act on the vector space. Okay? Now, suppose, so is this okay? Yes, sir. Achha. So suppose if I want to uh, simplify the system and I want to understand how these operators act in a much simpler fashion, the way I would do it is actually by being a little careful at the solving stage itself. What do I mean? So before I actually solve for the system, Suppose if I recognize what are the symmetries in this particular system, okay? Let us say, for example, that in this two-dimensional uh, example, it is, there is some Hamiltonian H, and let me claim that this Hamiltonian is such that uh, A commutes with this Hamiltonian, okay? So let us say A commutes with the Hamiltonian and let us say that B does not and let us say that C also commutes with this Hamiltonian, why not? Okay, so out of these three operators, even before I solve for this, let me claim that uh, A and C commute to this Hamiltonian and B does not commute to this Hamiltonian. So what does this mean? This means that before I solve for this particular system, Suppose if I recognize all the operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, then I can claim that A, H, and C have a set of common eigenstates. Okay, let me call this set of common eigenstates psi. So instead of solving for the uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, now I'm making my problem slightly broader. I'm claiming that I'm going to look for the set of common eigenstates of A, H, and C. So in this respect, in this particular problem, then A 
H and C are a complete set of commuting operators. So some books refer to this as complete set of commuting operators, CSCO. I will not use this uh, uh, abbreviation, but uh, it is employed in, uh, in the literature at some points. So what does this, uh, uh, this way of looking at things uh, uh, give me? So I know that since A, H, and C commute, and they have a complete set of commuting operators, the action of A and C on the Hilbert space is now trivial. So suppose if I solve for the system and I work out the common eigenstates, I know that suppose if the eigenstates are again, let me call this some alpha and beta instead of psi 1 and psi 2, right? Now since alpha and beta are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the action of H on this is very simple, right? But since H, uh, sorry, A and C also commute to the Hamiltonian, you know that alpha and beta, if you correctly choose alpha and beta, they would also be the eigenstates of the operators A and C. So now A acting on alpha would also be just this, and A acting on beta would also be this. Okay, similarly, B acting on alpha would just be something times alpha, and B acting on beta would be something times beta. So what does this give me? So what does the first set and the second set differ. The first set is also an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, uh, psi1 and psi2, but since I did not choose the eigenstates properly, which means that I did not choose uh, uh, the psi1 and psi2 such that they are also eigenstates of A and C, in which case this commutation property was not very apparent, then the action of A and C on this vector space can be something a little complicated. But if I choose the eigenstates correctly, such that the eigenstates that I begin with are the common eigenstates of both H, A, or H, A, and C in this case, then the action of A and C on this Hilbert space also becomes trivial because A and C are also diagonal operators in this Hilbert space, just like H, okay? So which means that if even before I start solving for the eigenstates, if I step back and understand what are the complete set of commuting operators in this particular problem? In other words, typically I want to understand what other operators in my problem commute with the Hamiltonian. And then if I solve for the eigenstates of Hamiltonian such that they are also eigenstates of A and C in this particular example, then the action of A and C on the uh, vectors in this Hilbert space become very trivial because A and C are also diagonal operators. So that is what I'm aiming at here. So when I say that something is a symmetry operator in quantum mechanics, I necessarily mean that that symmetry operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, okay? So in this particular respect, what I'm basically looking for in, before solving a complicated uh, differential equation uh, in spherical polar coordinates in quantum mechanics is, first I want to understand all the different physical operators with which the, operator, with which the Hamiltonian commutes. Now, once I have a set of all the operators with which the Hamiltonian commutes, in other words, I know all the symmetry operators in my particular problem, then I can devise a strategy with which I will uh, get the eigenstates of all these guys simultaneously, which means that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian that I will now derive in my, by solving this complicated differential equation, uh, I've not written the Schrodinger equation, have I? Uh, by this course, by this differential equation, I, I can be guaranteed that these size are also the eigenstates of all the other observables, all the other uh, symmetry observables. So which means that I know a lot of information about the system. I not only know what are the values of energy of the state psi, for example, I also know what, what its orbital angular momentum is, for example, okay? Or any other, any other uh, uh, symmetry that it can be a symmetry. Yes. Yes, sir. You said that here Hamiltonian commutes with A and commutes with B, but how can I guarantee that A and B will commute with each other? If you I cannot. take ang You cannot. Then, sir, how can how all three can have simultaneous eigenstate? So, okay. So, let us say. No, no, no. So, all I am claiming is that 
look. So let me let me take a particular example so that it's uh, easier for you. Sorry, I'll just uh, drink some water and come back. Just give me one second. Yes. <clears throat> so in this example, what do I mean? So I, I have a, a system wherein A commutes with a Hamiltonian and C commutes with the Hamiltonian. Um, sorry, B does not commute with the Hamiltonian. So I am claiming that in this particular case, A, H and C have a common set of eigenvectors. Now you're claiming that this is not possible. Yes. Yes, sir. If oh. I took angular momentum as an example, L square and L z. Ah, exactly. So L square commutes with the Hamiltonian and L z commutes with the Hamiltonian, which means the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates of the L square operator, eigenstates of the L z operator. That is what I claim. So if you already know this example, this is exactly what I'm claiming. No, no, sir. I'm talking about L square and L z, L square and L x, then L x and L z doesn't commute with each other. No, I'm not talking about LX at all. LX is a different operator. Okay, sir. All I'm saying is that in this particular example, L square, H and LZ have a common set of eigenstates. Okay. Of course, LX and in, in this, in this eigenstates will also not be eigenstates of LZ because LZ and LX do not commute. That is not the statement I'm making. I'm simply saying that L, in this particular example, L square, H and LZ will have a common set of eigenstates. So in, in my 2D example, all I mean is that a, H, and C will have a common set of eigenstates. But on this eigenstate, suppose if I act B, suppose if I act B on alpha, this will again be some B1 times alpha plus B2 times beta. B will not be a diagonal operator on this, on this basis. Yes? Yes, sir. Since B and H do not commute, and in general, then B and C do not commute, B and A do not commute. Uh, I'm not claiming in this in this example. I'm not claiming that A, B, and C commute. Okay, A, B, and C in general do not commute. All I'm claiming that I can find another operator H such that H and A commute and H and C commute. As we point out, this doesn't mean that A and C commute. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sir. Hello. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, as do you do we ha we must be having this uh, like we have position space do, uh, do we uh, do we have energy space yes so energy space is basically what we have been discussing for example in the harmonic oscillator system the energy space are the ends right so sho let's take the case of an sho a hamiltonian in this case is p square over 2m plus one half m omega square x hat square, yes? Make sense? Yes. So x hat square is symmetric under parity. Now I can solve for the eigenstates of this system, okay? So I'll solve for h psi equals e psi, okay? And then I get a whole bunch of size. So, but what are these size? This is psi one, this is psi two, this is psi three and so on. But all these sites are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator. Yes? So each of these sites have a different energy. The psi1, which is the ground state, has an energy 1 half h bar omega. Psi2 has n plus half h bar omega. So this has 3 half h bar omega. And this has 5 half h bar omega, and so on and so forth. Right? So these are all. So if you want, you can call this the energy space. So this is, this is characterized by the symbol n. N space or energy space in this particular case. But sir, we are, so I, I can think of, uh, so just like you can think of uh, the eigens functions of the position operator as a complete basis, I can think of the eigen functions of the Hamiltonian as a complete basis. So I can write any other function in terms of the eigen functions of the Hamiltonian operator for the simple harmonic oscillator. Yes, I can certainly do that. But sir, when you 
when you solved it you were you considered it in position space na so psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 would be in position space so psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 are the position space representations of the eigen ket yeah so suppose this is the eigen ket so this these are the eigen so if i write it in, in terms of n this is what it means right make sense so the n's are the eigen kets of the hamiltonian in in this day in this particular example n terms are to be discrete okay which means that in this particular space i can represent any other vector as a linear combination of the n's but suppose if i want to translate the same thing in position space then i have to write psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 but whatever it is the fundamental point is that since the eigen functions of a hermitian operator are guaranteed to be orthogonal i can use these as a basis set whether i write it in the ket notation or in the psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 notation it doesn't matter so, so h square h, h square omega by 2 3 by 2 h square omega and all this they would uh, they would be uh, energy functions they would be they would be the energy corresponding to the state psi 1 so look upon this in a different way so i we solved it using the a and a dagger operator yes but i need not have solved it using the a and a dagger operator i would have just solved the schrodinger equation like this d square psi dx square plus 1 half m omega 0 square x square psi equals e psi yeah this is a differential equation second order differential equation yes yes so now uh, what does this mean this is basically the statement that h so minus h d square dx square plus 1 half m omega 0 square x square this is the hamiltonian in position space psi equals e psi right this is h psi equals e psi so if yes. i solve if i solve this differential equation instead of doing it in the uh, uh, a a dagger mode i would have directly gotten these wave functions okay and these wave functions would correspond to specific energies according to this particular equation and these energies would be 1/2 h bar omega 3/2 h bar omega and so on and so forth does this make sense Okay, so, so when you say your energy space, I think what you mean is that can you use the eigen functions of the Hamiltonian as a basis and call this energy basis? My answer is yes, you can. In fact, you can use the uh, eigen functions of any Hermitian operator as a basis. Does it answer your question or no? Actually, sir, you made a statement that uh, can you go a, a previous slide? See, so you made the statement that H uh, A they are diagonal, right? Hmm. So I was thinking that for them to be diagonal, they have to be in the same basis, right? Correct. So again, uh, so when 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 you say diagonal, what do you mean? So take the example of two operators. So let take A, B. c and h operator right my so i'm this is just an illustration i'm claiming that h and a and c commute but h and b do not commute okay this is my starting point okay now let me solve for the eigen states of a Uh, or h or so I, i'll solve for the eigen states in such a fashion that they are the common eigen states of h a and c okay and let me call these eigen states alpha beta now when i claim that the operator is diagonal what do i mean so initially let me use the basis vectors in this in this two dimensional space i will use the basis vectors 1 and 2 okay so suppose if i transform from the basis 1 2 to the basis which are the common eigen states of h a and c in this basis of course none of these would be diagonal but when re expressed in the, in this basis h a and c will be diagonal 
Why? Because these are the eigenvectors of H, A, and C. So if you use the eigenvectors of a, of a matrix as the basis, then in this basis, the matrix is necessarily diagonal. This is a very basic statement about linear algebra. Okay. So when I say in the when I say that you can diagonalize the matrices, this is the statement we often make, right? When you have two matrices that commute, then you can diagonalize them simultaneously. It simply means that they have a common set of eigenvectors, and you can use this common set of eigenvectors as the basis vector. And when you re-express the matrix in terms of this basis vector, then the matrices will be diagonal at this particular basis. Yes. Okay. okay. So I'll erase this part. If you have any other questions, please do stop me and ask. Okay, so the fundamental point that was raised initially is where is it that we are going with all this construction? The, uh, the where we are going with this construction is simply, I want to extend this example of a 2D uh, uh, case to the example of infinite dimensional Hamiltonians and to solve this uh, Schrodinger equation in, in, for a general potential, it is always useful to recognize all the symmetries that are there in this potential. If I recognize all the symmetries that are there in this potential, then I can solve the uh, equation in such a fashion that I get the common eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian with all these symmetry operators. Then my Hilbert space is actually a little easier to work with because all the symmetry operators will act on this Hilbert space to give me the exact same vectors back again. They would not give me a linear combination because these are also eigenstates of the uh, symmetry operator. So the goal is to find the complete set of commuting operators given a potential. And once I know the complete set of commuting operators, I can solve for the common eigenfunctions of this complete set of commuting operators. The second point is that the other way to say complete set of commuting operators is that one of the operators is always the Hamiltonian because you are solving the Schrodinger equation. So you want the energy eigenstates. So another way of saying the same thing is that I want all the operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. I'm going backwards here. So if you want all the operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, that necessarily means that you're looking for all the symmetry operators in this particular system. Okay, because it is a symmetry operator that commute with the Hamilton. So as we have just demonstrated, you can take two vectors that are related by a symmetry operator and they will both have the exact same energy. So to reformulate our question, we look to find all physical operators that commute with H. Okay. These are the symmetry operators of the given system. We then solve for the common eigenstates of these operators and the Hamiltonian operator H. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. This is the general strategy in solving problems in quantum mechanics. Of course, we did not make this apparent in simple one-dimensional cases because those are all uh, quite uh, straightforward to solve. But if you have a general three-dimensional case, it is always useful to recognize all the operators that commute with the Hamiltonian and then solve for the common eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian and all these uh, particular uh, symmetry operators. So coming back to the central force problem, and uh, we will not set up the problem completely today. I will take one more lecture to set up the problem. But if you go back to the central force problem, 
since the force only depends on the absolute magnitude of the distance and not on the angular coordinates, you can always rotate and you would not change the energy. So since there is an implicit rotational symmetry in the problem because of the structure of the potential, Hamiltonian in this case is minus h bar square over 2 mu. I will use mu for the mass. Uh, I'll explain why I'm changing symbols uh, midway. Del square plus V of R, where R is, let us say, square root of x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square. Okay? Since the potential is only a function of the absolute distance and not on the angles. There is an implicit rotational symmetry in the problem. Rotational symmetry. So what is this rotational symmetry? So in classical mechanics, you know that the angular momentum operate, and the angular, no, there's no operator, forgive me. In classical mechanics, you know the angular momentum is basically, uh, x vector cross p vector, right? So in quantum mechanics, of course, this becomes an operator. This becomes an operator L. I mean, I should typically write L hat, which is x hat cross p hat, okay? Now, if you're really careful, you should also stop me at this stage and say, no, no, you have to symmetrize this operator because x and p do not commute. That is not quite the case. Even though x and p do not commute, the cross product is actually a Hermitian product because when you evaluate the cross product, you never have terms like x times ddx. Okay, it's always x in one direction and differential in another direction, x ddy minus y ddx and so on and so forth. And x and dx do not commute, but x and dy do commute. Okay, so I don't have to symmetrize this operator. I can simply write this as x cross p and angular momentum is actually a Hermitian operator in quantum mechanics. So plugging in the definition of the momentum operator. Now, since I also have to write a vector symbol, I will not uh, calc I will not put the operator symbol explicitly. Uh, the operator symbol is uh, sort of you know implicit in this calculation. So p vector is minus i h bar del operator. Again, I remind you the del operator is a vector operator, and I will uh, make the definition of a vector operator precise in the next lecture. It has components d dx, d dy, and d dz in Cartesian coordinate system. If you plug in this definition, my L in quantum mechanics turns out to be minus I H bar X cross del. Okay. Now I will simply write this in component notation and uh, we will stop for today. Uh, does every, or is everyone comfortable with the levi Chavita symbol, epsilon I J K? Is there anyone yes, who has not seen this symbol before? That's a better Yes, question. sir. Is there anyone here who has not seen this symbol before? Okay, very good. This makes my life easier. So, the Levi Chavita symbol, epsilon ijk, is one for even permutations of ijk and minus one for odd permutations of i, j, k and zero otherwise. Otherwise simply means that if i equal to j, then it is equal to zero. So in other words, epsilon one, two, three equals epsilon two, three, one equals epsilon three, one, two is plus one. And things like epsilon one, three, two equals epsilon uh, three, two, one equals epsilon, what's the other one? 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3. This is minus 1. And things like epsilon 1, 1, 3 are 0. Okay, if two symbols are the same, it's 0. In other words, epsilon ijk is antisymmetric in all antisymmetric in ijk. Okay. Now, an important property of antisymmetric tensors of this kind is that if you multiply an antisymmetric tensor with a symmetric tensor, you get 0. So in other words, for example, if I have a, a vector whose components are v1, v2, v3, 
And suppose if I consider the product epsilon ijk times vi vj plus vj vi, this is identically equal to zero. Why is that? Because this bracket that I have is symmetric in j and i. If I exchange j and i, I get the exact same thing back again. This, is, this becomes vj vi plus vi vj, which is the same as this. But if I exchange j and i outside the epsilon symbol, I get a minus one. So this is equal to minus epsilon ijk. So for every factor of vi vj plus vj vi, there is another factor of minus of the same quantity. So they all add up to zero. Another thing that is implicit here is the summation convention. This is Einstein's summation convention. It simply means that repeated indices are always summed. Okay. For example, a i j e j is equal to a i. Suppose if i and j go from one to two, one to three, this means a i one e one plus a i two e two plus a i three e three, and so on and so forth. I don't, so uh, this is the same, I can, I can write the exact same thing as AIJEJ, e, or I can just drop the summation and the summation is understood in the repeated index J, okay? When Einstein was working out GR, uh, he had to use a lot of repeated symbols, so he came up with this nice shorthand that I will leave the summation to be understood. So this is named after Einstein, Einstein summation convention. So I will uh, use this summation convention and the epsilon symbol to write my L operator as minus i h bar, Eps, the, I'll not write the L operator, sorry. I'll write the ith component of the L operator, which is an operator as epsilon i j k x j d d x k. Okay? So this is my angular momentum operator and please become comfortable with this because in the next lecture we'll be doing a lot of horrible calculation involving a bunch of epsilons and lots of commutation relations and things like that. Uh, these are all very important uh, even though they can be a little tiresome but you have to do. Uh, so let us actually verify this for example L1 operator would be minus i h bar i is 1 so epsilon 1 j k x j d d x k now i will use a summation this is minus i h bar now since the first symbol is fixed to be one j and k cannot be one if j or k is equal to one then the epsilon symbol becomes zero so j and k have to be two or three so there is only two uh, options j is two and k is three or j is three and k is two so let me use both of them so epsilon one two three i'll fix j as two and k as three this is x2 d d x3 plus epsilon. Now I'll fix j as 3 and k as 2, 1, 3, 2, x3 d d x2. And this is equal to epsilon 1, 2, 3, as you know, is 1. So this is x2 d d x3. And epsilon 1, 3, 2 is minus 1. So this is minus x3 d d x2. Okay. If I write it in terms of x, y, and z, this simply means that Lx is minus i h bar y d d z minus z d d y. But for the next couple of lectures, at least I'll be using x1, x2, x3 because the epsilon manipulations become a little easier when looked at uh, when when you use this particular notation. But of course, when you solve the Schrodinger equation, we will go back to Lx, Ly, and Lz. Anyway, so this is the angular momentum operator in quantum mechanics. In the next lecture, I will uh, demonstrate that this operator is indeed a symmetry operator for the central force problem by explicitly demonstrating that it commutes with the Hamiltonian. And we will also develop a very nice set of commutation relations between the different L operators. And we will define a vector operator by how the L vector commutes with the vector operator. So these are things we will talk about in the next lecture. And we will finally set up the Hamiltonian for the central force problem. And then if time permits, we can also uh, talk about how to go about solving this particular system. Okay. So I'll stop here.